Hello there, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Hi. Happy December. Um, how absolutely crazy is it that we are currently in December? I find that to be uh, alarming. <laughs> In the best possible way, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Hi, everybody. How's it going? Hello, hello, hello. Lovely to see you all here. Thank you so much for joining me. I know I'm mixing it up a little bit, but it's kind of fun. So, you know, we're starting off the month with a little stuff and then it gets pretty quiet, but I'm so happy to see you guys. Thanks for being here. Hello, Doug. It's lovely to see you too. Yay. Um, hi. Yes, please. Chats always love them. Makes me happy. Um, so how is everybody doing this month? <laughs> I would love, as always, I love to see what people are drinking. I have this lovely, I know there's some other people who may have this as well, this lovely uh, St. Cone Cote du Rhone, uh, which actually I feel like works really well for today's topic, only because, you know, today is all about kind of deciphering something that's really kind of complicated and not at the same time, right? It's all about finding the wine, but it's also about kind of knowing that um, everywhere you go, it's going to be different. So, um, you know, it, it's it's sort of always a little bit of a, a crapshoot, <laughs> I suppose you could say. But the goal is, of course, to make sure that you have the, you know, just to feel confident about it. Because I think a lot of things, the most, the most important thing about all of this is that I think a lot of people um, find wine lists, and, and, and rightly so, extremely intimidating, um, especially the fancier your restaurant. Suddenly you're just like, my goodness, what am I supposed to do with all of this paper in front of me? And some of these, uh, some of these things are definitely, uh, and sorry, I think I might be flickering a little bit, you guys. I'm sorry about that. I seem to be having a little connectivity, but hopefully you can still hear me. Um, and if there's anything that goes wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm doing my best for that. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's kind of fun. And I think, I mean, most of you here, I think love wine and like have, have been to restaurants to drink wine before. I certainly hope so. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. But the idea is of course, being able to, um, you know, take what you already know, because just because you drink wine, you, you still know quite a lot. Sandra's drinking some Albarino. I love it. I always love the Albarino. Um, but you know, it's like, I do, I do want people to walk away from this, at least, I guess, feeling a little bit more like what you know is really, really enough to pick a good bottle of wine um, based on what you need. And is it going to always get you the best bottle of wine? Possibly not. But like, that's what, that's what usually, um, hopefully, you have people there to ask who are knowledgeable about it. And uh, I mean, I still rely heavily on my servers and my, um, um, sommeliers, if they if they are available, uh, I love their recommendations because they are the ones that usually kind of know the secret stuff, which is what I'm always after. I'm like, where's the special find, right? But to get there, before you get there, there's a couple things we'll go over. So, all right, I think we're maybe good. I'm gonna go ahead and get started and share a little bit of this screen here. Uh, and it's gonna be it's gonna be a fun one today because I'm gonna kind of bounce back and forth a little bit when it comes to my screen. So. I like I have some I have some images that don't quite look right on the uh, <laughs> um, on the P on the you know the the PowerPoint thing, so I will go to back and forth. It should be okay. I feel pretty confident about it. So, but first I'm going to go ahead and get this screen shared for you, which is basic like my basic one here, and then make sure I get everyone's. I want to make sure I still have the. Um, there we are can see everybody and get the chat up. Perfect. Oh, great, Suzanne, drinking a sparkling raspberry malt beverage. <laughs> there, yes, a, a sparkling malt beverages do tend, uh, they're not wine, technically, um, as a malt beverage, they would be a malt beverage, a malted beverage. Um, I actually, I, I wish I could have more expertise on that specific topic, but I do not. Um, generally, though, they do tend to go into the malted beverage category, I believe, which is more considering like, you know, your beers and such. But um, so anyway, we are here. We are, we are looking at deciphering the restaurant wine list and kind of going through this a little step by step. But uh, it's, it's very fun for me. And, and again, please, please keep in mind, this is my experience and my opinion. And there is, you know, there are many, many ways to do this, but this is just sort of how I like to go through it. I thought it might be fun to share with people. Oh, I've got some more people. There we are. So I have got, 
Oh, I've got more people. Sorry, more people are telling me what they're drinking. I love it. Tell me, tell me, share it with me. Stephanie Simpson is drinking a 2016 Gerachi Vineyards and Farms Primitivo. Beautiful. Um, we've got eating spaghetti and squash and bacon jam and feta. What's my wine pair? That's a different class. <laughs> but I would say um, bacon jam and feta. I would probably go with a nice Grenache on that one. That sounds kind of like it could be fun. Uh, maybe a Southern Rome kind of thing. But then again, that's me. And this is what we're going to talk about. So when we're talking about, you know, deciphering the restaurant wine list, there is one thing that I do like to share uh, about it, which is that, you know, to me, I, it's like my favorite thing. It's like opening a Christmas present when I go into a restaurant and I get to see a wine list. I'm always like, oh, give it right here. I can't wait to look at this, right? Because I've got basically... Um, yeah, sorry, I had a few more people join again. Yay, I love this. I'm glad that we've got the people. Um, so, you know, to me, it's really like a treasure, a treasure chest. It is, I get so excited to look at a wine list because I want to see what they have and I want to see. Now, granted, you know, I feel pretty comfortable and confident about that, but there's no reason you can't as well. It is just important to know that there are a variety of ways that a list is going to be laid out that can be helpful for you when you're trying to make a decision and also kind of guide you based on how the beverage director may or may not be choosing to set up that list. But um, there are a few basics. And, and the longer the list, it just means more options. So don't get intimidated by a really long list. Um, be aware too, like when you're in a restaurant that has a really long list with lots of super awesome options, there is a good chance that there will be someone there who you can ask questions to. And it's so, so helpful and so important. Always ask questions. I still do to this day, all the time. Lots and lots of obnoxious ones, all the time. <laughs> drinking a 2010 Brandon Cab, Sonoma County, very nice. Marcus is not drinking wine either. Cider, but you know what? Hey, it's, it's you know, whatever works for you. Something just to get that thirst quenched is all I care about while we're doing this. But as we're looking, so I kind of wanted to go um, again, as we're going a little bit back and forth on this, but we've got a um, DTD. You guys are so patient with me. I'm sorry about this. Well, maybe we'll go over the, um, the list at the end. I think I'll do that then just to kind of like save you guys the <laughs> battering of going through this. But as we are looking at this, you know, the other, other part of, you know, a wine list is that as we're going through, you know, um, talking about organizing a wine list. There is no regulated way across like all, you'd think there would be at this point, but there's no real way that you have to organize a wine list. If you ever find yourself becoming a beverage director of a restaurant, you know, you're going to have your previous experience possibly that you're going to work with. You're going to go ahead and go off of what you know and what you like. Um, the goal of organizing a wine list should be to make it as clear as possible for the consumer to understand. But there are a lot of different groupings that you'll often see in restaurant wine lists. Um, and there are a variety of ways to do that, but some of them are very basic. A lot of these are sort of combined in different ways and it will sort of depend on what, again, the priorities are of the beverage director or sommelier um, who is putting together that list. Because an individual is going through. And there are things like templates that you can look at that would like, if you go online, it's really funny to look at wine, wine list templates and be like, I've seen that at a restaurant before. Uh, those like sort of, you know, curvy, curvy wine glass um, gifts and things like that that are on there. But to begin with, you know, by style is probably the most, uh, most universal way that a wine list is going to be organized. And by style, what I mean is sparkling wine, white wine and rosé wine. Now this can be a little, you know, up in the air in terms of sometimes rosé goes in its own category. Sometimes it's placed with white wines. Sometimes it's sort of, uh, for without without really understanding why you know they might even put it in the sparkling wine because it's a sparkling rosé but so rosé is often a interplaced category uh that may go wherever they feel it serves the you know the the list best um but usually a lot of times i'll see it kind of buried in with the white wines or you know with the with, it, with its own category and then of course we have got um your red wines which is going to be your next style category as usual and then finally usually you'll see some sort of dessert wine section um this may be relegated to a dessert wine list as opposed to actually being on the main list but a lot of times you'll also see it on the you know on the full list as well sort of at the end of it um, now the next one is of course uh, very, it's also common to see it organized by grape. And this is something that we see um, much, much more commonly in, uh, in the United States. It's very funny, I have, the, I have various uh, demonstrations of lists that we're gonna look at. Uh, I was trying to find a list from 
France or from Italy, just so we could look at it. But the truth of the matter is they don't put their wine lists online. Uh, it's a very, very, uh, they have all of their, you know, their food food menus that will be online. But it's not quite as typical to see their, their wine lists online. And that's very true. But um, going back to my first slide, which I missed um, when I talk about it being sort of a roadmap or like a map to your, you know, um, wine entertainment and enjoyment. Uh, in France, it's literally called the carte du vin, which means map of wine. Uh, and that is a great way to think about it as sort of a way to guide you through your your wine experience. Now by grape is something that's very typical um, because we also label our wines by grape and by varietal in the new world. So by Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon, that's where you're gonna kind of notice uh, something that may be more familiar to you because you may have more familiarity with specific varietals that you like, which is very important to know. Um, and also uh, knowing that sometimes it might not tell you what the grape is that's on the list. And there are reasons for that potentially as we'll look at because the wine comes from a specific region um, that is you know, one of the old world regions where there's only one grape varietal that it could be uh, or there's specified grape varietals so they don't feel the need to put it on the label. And in other cases, you'll see the grape varietal uh, as a heading sometimes. Um, you might see the, um, you know, the entire menu laid out by varietal, which is oftentimes for our uh, American kind of association, a much easier way to go to kind of uh, to move forward with your, your wine list. Um, next, you'll often see as well, and again, these can all be intermixed together, a wine list that is um, organized by region. Also very helpful, and not always is this done. Um, usually, you know, going between grape varietal and region, you might see a whole section of a specific varietal. And within that, you'll be noted, they will note the regions, but they will not necessarily organize it by region. Um, and in, in some cases though, it's perhaps only one region's wine that is on the list at all, uh, because we're in sort of, and we'll look at that too, if you're in a specific, you know, um, if you are in a specific uh, restaurant that only does one type of cuisine or perhaps specializes in a type of regional cuisine, you may only see regional wines from there, which in a way is very helpful because it helps you to kind of narrow it down, but may, you may be more unfamiliar with those particular varietals and or wines. Um, and then, you know, the idea is that, you know, having it say France or California, you might be more familiar with French wines or with California wines or Italian wines, or you might not be and you want to try something from there so you can focus your, your attention on that particular region. Now, I am going to go ahead and move over to the wines lists right now because I feel like it's very important that we kind of get into this. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a fun thing to kind of look at all these guys and I want to make sure that I share them. Do, do, do. Where is that? There we are. So um, this is what I'm gonna share with you first. So this is, for example, I know this is all PDF, but I'm gonna go ahead and see. Everyone can see this okay, I hope? I hope you can. So um, I've just made it a little bit bigger. I've taken the names off of these, but we're gonna kind of go through these. So I don't know if you can see the full list of this PDF, but this particular wine list happens to have 73 pages. This would be one of those wine lists where you would walk in and they would hand you essentially a, a leather bound binder with all of the different wines that are in there. And you might go a little bit like, uh, you know, deer in headlights trying to decide how to even begin to approach this. So what I just kind of, kind of want to look at and we'll review these again as we come back. What I want to show you is that if you just take a breath and kind of look at how it's originally laid out, you can see right here, usually we're going to start off with by the glass and they're here, they're breaking it down by sparkling and champagne, just like we thought they would. White, rosé here, this one little wine has its own section, which is so nice. Um, then you have, you know, red, sake in this particular case. And here you can even see they have a late harvest section, which would be akin to like a dessert wine, right? Down here, as you move forward, these are all still by the glass, of course, these are fortifieds uh, and you're getting into your sherries and then they move into half bottles. So, you know, we're only on page two of this. And as you can see, they really, really kind of get very, very in depth. This is a high end restaurant that is looking to specify and specialize in their wine list. Um, they believe, you know, there are there are awards that are given out for for beautiful wine lists. Um, and as you can see here, I mean, we're going into 
um, they even write it down by country. So you have country and then grape varietal within the country. So these are giving you a lot of opportunities. We also have over here, it's important to note, usually you should see a vintage associated with that wine. Um, this is important because of course, as we know, the vintage of the wine can make a difference in some places. Whereas, you know, in other places it might not be, uh, you know, new world wines may not be quite as, uh, <laughs> Deborah, I'll say, I'll say, I can't really say, but um, you have the idea, you may have been here to this restaurant, you may recognize it, but I'm not going to say what it is. So you can see we have a really, really extensive, really detailed list that is showing you exactly what, you know, they have and very, very detailed. This is a good sign, honestly, because it's going to give you as much information as possible, but based exactly again, you know, where you need to know the varietal, they'll tell you, um, where you don't need to know the varietal, for example, you know, Bordeaux, uh, Pesac Léonion, you know it's going to be uh, a Cabernet, most likely a red Cabernet blend. That's what that's what Bordeaux red wines are. And then you have your vintage, your wines by the bottle, of course, right over here. Um, this is going to be a great example of a much simpler wine list. Um, so here, this is also, this is a fun little, I don't know where this example was just up online. I was like, this is pretty basic. And this is also very much not in our country, but you're, you had, actually it may be, but um, you've got, you know, champagne, Rhine wine, <laughs> right? Um, the M before the V stand for Linda, are we talking about the, uh, which one? <laughs> was it, were, are, are you referencing the previous one or this, this existing one that I'm talking about? Um, the previous one. Okay, let's take a look at it and find out. So in our previous wine list, the MV, oh, the NV, sorry, um, up here, this means multi-vintage. So this makes sense because we're talking about champagne here. So when usually you'll see NV for non-vintage on champagne, but multi-vintage is another way of saying it because champagnes are generally made from, yes, no problem, are made from a conglomeration of various years. It's a cuvee of multiple years or multiple vintages. Um, this is our super basic one where you can see they're, they're breaking it down by dry catalba, you know, just in case you wanted some of this uh, Longworth's golden Wedding, <laughs> um, you or the Doom Dumais works. Um, California again. These are ports, sherries, Madeiras. They're talking. I mean, this is a fairly simple but also very confusing wine list, right? Because we don't necessarily know. We have brandies, rums, whiskeys, gins. You know, it's a little bit. But the thing is, it's a one-page list compared to seventy-three pages on the previous one, right? Um, and then you know, so just a sort of basics by there. These are some examples of kind of the extremes you can get. Uh, it's very fun to also say, you know. There are times when you have wine lists and you walk into like some pretty basic places and it might even say red, white, and pink, which makes it very simple for you to choose what you're doing. And oftentimes those are great because they end up being, you know, <laughs> they end up being around like $4 a glass or something along those, something great along those lines where we can have all sorts of opportunities <laughs> to try a little bit of everything, right? Um, so moving forward to like moving on by region, once you've seen this wine list, once you're here, what are we going to do? So here's how you want to break it down when you start to approach your own wine lists, which I think is what is all very helpful for us to kind of, no matter what length it is, no matter how simple or how complex, ask yourself a few questions to help you narrow down um, what you're looking for, because obviously there's a lot to look through and the more specific you can be about what you're looking for, the easier it is to pick something. So um, the first questions of course are things like, what are you having for dinner? If you don't know yet what you're having for dinner, there's also things like, what kind of a restaurant are you at? Are you at a sushi restaurant? Are you at a steakhouse? Um, are you at a Mediterranean cuisine restaurant? Um, the type of food that you're planning to eat will help inform what might be a good choice for you. Uh, this is usually it's good to remember when we're talking about super basic food and wine pairings the the it's the food that is going to make the wine taste a little bit off more than the wine will make the food taste off so the the good news is that oftentimes glass pours if you're just not certain you can usually get just a glass pour and most of those wines should be selected by the beverage director to go with a multitude of the cuisines that are on the menu they should be versatile um not necessarily simple but maybe simple um so your glass pours are usually your kind of go-to's that give you an opportunity to just have something uh, that can go with anything. If you're not sure what you're gonna eat, it's a good bet that something on the glass menu should work with most cuisines. Um, but it's also good to say for your preference, what do you want? Do you want a red wine? Do you want a, a white wine? And you might not know the answer to that, but of course, if you have 
a, a preference, then that's going to cut down your, your searching by half. Then you just have to figure out which part of the section it is that you're looking for. Um, the next most important question, and I think this is really important for everyone to kind of have, because if you drink wine, you, you know what you like, but a lot of times people are like, oh, I don't know. I don't know what kind of wine I like. But if you think back, I mean, it's, it's a great opportunity to just take a, a step back and think about what do you drink most? Is it red or white? Does it tend to be fuller bodied, really rich? If it's red, does it have a lot of tannins? If it's white, does it have a lot of acidity? You know, are these kinds of what do you notice yourself being drawn more to? For me, for example, I know that I tend to like really earthy wines, both red and white, white wines with lots and lots of acidity. I tend to like lighter red wines or um, older, richer red wines with some age on them. I know that these are kind of things that I just happen to like. If I'm out at a restaurant, these are some things that I'm going to look at first because I know kind of where my palate already lands. Um, and then, of course, what regions are you familiar with? Uh, this is this is as you're drinking wine and learning about wine, you know, you're going to start to recognize different places that will usually give you a pretty consistent wine that you enjoy. This is things like, you know, old world versus new world is a really great example of that because old world and new world are kind of your, your most, it's like your most sort of variant basic di division, right? Do you tend to like wines that are fruitier and um, more fruit forward and more, um, fuller bodied potentially, and those tend to be more of your new world style wines. You tend to have, uh, if you like earthier, kind of uh, more mineral driven wines with less fruit sometimes, not necessarily less fruit, but that just tend to be a little bit more um, austere, tending to have a little bit more acidity, you may be more drawn to old world wines. These are of course stylistic choices as we definitely have fruit forward wines that can come from uh, old world countries and vice versa. But it's just a good kind of reference point to know for yourself, what kind of palette style are you drawn to? It's another thing that we didn't talk about, but I'll, when we look at some of the menus, we'll see, you know, sometimes the, the sommelier or beverage director is super helpful and they put tasting notes in there for you, right? Like three words that say light, crisp, apple, and you're like, cool. But again, too, it's a little bit generic, right? Like there's a lot of white wines that can be described as light, crisp apple. But if you see light, crisp apple versus um, rich, creamy buttermilk, you know, these are two very different stylistic choices for white wines, I would, I would argue, <laughs> if everyone's on board with me with that. You know, so like those little markers are usually just as, as quick and concise as possible to help you kind of get an idea of what to expect from that from that bottle or glass of wine. So moving into actually deciding on the list, on when you get to the list itself, we wanna go ahead and say, just open the list for a first pass, just take it and rip open that wine list and just start taking a look at it. Because that first look is going to be, don't be intimidated by how big it is or how short it is, just take a look. And just a quick a quick, you know, um, pass through will kind of let you know how they're organizing it. Are you seeing the names of countries above like little chunks? Are you just seeing red, white, rosé? Are you seeing names of grape varietals, Chardonnay, Syrah? Um, Pinot Noir, Cabernet, these are all different categories and that's going to help you right away orient yourself to how you're going to read this list. It's a very, very simple orientation, but it's so helpful. Um, next, of course, this is really, really important because a lot of people get hung up on price points. I am very, very frugal. <laughs> I have been in a business where I see what the wine costs, I know what it costs wholesale versus retail versus restaurant. And it can be very, very challenging to look at a bottle of wine on a restaurant list and just know that I could get it for about an eighth of the price if I was buying it wholesale, right? It's, it's challenging. So I'm always out to look for a good value and I have no qualms. And any, any Psalm or any waiter worth his salt should never ever scoff at a price point. It is absolutely totally okay to say, my price point is around 20, what do you have? And they, it is their responsibility to find something for you to enjoy uh, around. I mean, it's simply, it's simply the way that it works. I mean, you don't have to be rude about it. Like I kind of sounded rude there, didn't mean to. But the idea is, is that every price point is acceptable. Don't feel like you have to spend too much money to get a good bottle of wine. Um, a good wine list is always going to have options at every price point and or it should. Um, whether we are at French Laundry or whether we are at Applebee's, these should all be things that, uh, you know, I, I did actually try to look up the Applebee's wine list. They didn't have it online, turns out, <laughs> um, in case anyone was curious about that. But um, Sandra was saying, 
Um, I always Google a wine price before ordering. If the glass is more than a third of the bottle, I pass. Well, you know, it's interesting um, because technically a lot of times the glass is usually around a quarter of the, well, yeah, if the glass is more than a third of the bottle, yes, because then you might as well order the bottle as well. So it's interesting also to know how much are you going to drink if there's two of you and you're going to have two glasses of wine each, it's often more cost effective to just buy a full bottle than it is to go buy the glass. But if you want to try different things, you know, that's great. And depending on the restaurant, they may even do tasting pours if you want to do a variety of things. That will be limited to what they do have available by the glass, but but, you know, hey, that might work great for you. Um, and then it's also like the, uh, but it's just know that you should get, um, ask questions. And the best way to approach your server or your sommelier who's there coming for you, those questions that we just asked, those four questions, what are you eating? What do you like? What regions are you familiar with? Um, those kinds of questions, just kind of knowing basic answers to that are good guidelines for the for the sommelier to work with. It's really challenging for a som or a waiter if you're like if you're like, can you recommend a good bottle of wine? You know, if they have a list of a hundred bottles, there's any number of things, and you know, price point is totally valid to be a part of that. So knowing that, just feel totally comfortable and confident saying, hey, you know what? I'm looking for a good recommendation um, around, you know, 60 bucks. Um, we're having, we're having the fish. I'm having, I'm having the sea bass and he's having a, a peppered steak. What can you recommend? You know, it should be a fun challenge for them, right? <laughs> In which case they might be, you should both get glasses of wine, but you know, hopefully they'll be like, well, you know, there's a few different options that we can work with here. Uh, I would recommend this, this, and this, and they should give you three different options, probably in various price points, possibly a couple over what you've given them. It's usually how it goes, but that's okay. Um, just knowing like if you just a little bit of information to narrow it down, red, white, um, region, if you know that, or grape varietal, if you have a favorite, you can say something like that, right? And they can do that their best to like work on that with you. And then just a quick thing I wanted to mention too, is that you know, when you are at a restaurant and you've ordered this, I'm sure you've all had the experience of tasting the wine. So like the, the sommelier comes forward and like, is like sort of like presents the bottle to show you the label. And there's like, I just wanted to mention this because the, there's some confusion sometimes about that tasting process, right? The, um, the tasting process is not about if you like the wine or not. The tasting process is about, did you get the bottle of wine that you ordered? So that's the presentation part to say, this is the bottle of wine. This is the vintage that you ordered. Everything is kosher from what we said on the menu to what you're getting, to what you're paying for. So this is just general, they'll present it, they'll open it. And then the first taste is always poured to the person who ordered it or should be. And it's that person's response with, you know, you, oh, you're very, very fancy. You know, you sort of swirl, you sniff, you, and you taste it. Uh, again, it's not about whether or not you like it because you have ordered it now. <laughs> but it is about, is it faulty? Is it corked? Has, is there some sort of, you know, uh, other kind of matterization that's happened within the bottle that somehow indicates that this bottle is no longer good in the sense of structurally sound, right? Um, there's a good chance, I mean, you might not like the bottle of wine and you could send it back for that, but that's not really the purpose because once you do order the bottle of wine, you sort of take on that, that ownership of, I'm drinking this wine. And then it's also good to know with the, uh, you know, once you have your wine, you enjoy it. Because if you're out to dinner, for example, with four people, it's really easy to go through a bottle of wine. <laughs> it's about four glasses. Everyone gets a glass. If you liked that wine, you can order another bottle. Or you know what, if you didn't like that wine, or even if you did like that wine, but you want to try something else, you can order another bottle of something. I always recommend, you know, and you can, if let's say you have six people even. Um, six people is a great kind of number, honestly, to me, if you want to try a lot of different wines, right? Because one bottle among six people, it's just a little bit less than a glass. It's a little bit more than a tasting pour, enough to kind of give you an opportunity to explore the wine and enjoy it. But then also, you know, maybe get a couple of bottles of something else. It's a good try. Uh, I always like that. Uh, listen, Paul is asking, are the men in my life okay with you grabbing the wine list? You bet they are. They are so grateful when I pull that list. They are very, very happy. And I don't even ask. I just immediately take it. <laughs> I'm, a little, I'm a little bossy when it comes to the wine list. <laughs> And so far I've had no complaints, which is good. Um, so just uh, now as we go back, I want to go back to the um, to sharing these kinds of other wine list examples with you that I mentioned. So we were on, if you remember, the basic wine list here. 
where we've got, uh, you know, champagne. So these are a couple other examples that I want to show you. This is an example of a steakhouse restaurant, right? So this is a pretty basic steakhouse. Again, you're looking, we have champagne and sparkling right at the top. Um, if you can see this too, this page is now nine pages or this list is now nine pages long, roughly speaking. So, you know, we're getting a little bit more tailored down, but ultimately you're looking at kind of, you know, more of a steakhouse approach. So you have champagne and sparkling. Here you can see um, you'll have always the producer name or you should. Um, and then you've got here, they're actually indicating, you know, the level of, um, the level of, uh, you know, uh, dosage on each of these wines, which is indicated by Brut, Brut Rosé, in case it's, it's just a stylistic. So they're helping you out. This one doesn't happen to have actual numbers on it, but that's okay. Sandra's asking, what are the standard ounce wine pours, tasting menu versus average full pour? So generally speaking, a five ounce pour is gonna be your standard uh, pour for a restaurant technically, because that gives you five glasses per bottle. Uh, a lot of places will do six ounce pours or sometimes even four ounce pours. It's kind of a proprietary choice based on the restaurant itself. Um, tastings are usually three ounces, um, which would be half of like, you know, your full glass, which would be six ounces. But a lot of times at fancy places, you might even say that there is a, um, you know, uh, the five ounce pour tends to be kind of more standard. A lot of times too, you'll see, even when they come out, this is pretty typical these days, they'll come out with a little mini carafe, right? They'll pre-pour it into the appropriate amount, leave the carafe with you. And they don't even fill the glass all the way because you remember like, this is about as full as you ever want your glass. You don't necessarily, as you are uh, drinking wine, it's not about filling the glass at the top. It's about about having just a little bit in there to enjoy. And the same thing should happen when the wine is poured for you at the table. You know, you're not filling up that glass. You're just getting enough in there because you got the whole bottle. It's your bottle. You don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to go, uh, go uh, you know, all out on the first glass there. You can kind of enjoy it. And then it's sort of more fun, right? It's a little bit more interactive and you get to see more of that. So here, you know, we've got champagne sparkling and then, which makes sense. So we've got a, you know, a, a steakhouse and we are being, you know, uh, we're focused on our Pinot Noir. We're focused on our varietal because this is a very, very sort of um, American, Americanized kind of version as the steakhouse is. Um, down here, I want you to start looking. We can see also, again, pretty typical for an American steakhouse. You've got a lot of California. You've got a lot of domestic down here, Oregon. So you're starting to see you have the name of the producer, you have the grape varietal, you have the name of the wine, the proprietary name of the wine, whatever it might be, or the vineyard uh, that it comes from, the region, the subregion, and then the general region, which is California here. Um, the same thing up here when you look at, you know, uh, the Ferrari Brut, Trento, Trentino, Italy, non-vintage. Um, you've got, you know, Champagne, Champagne, um, Prosecco to give you an indication of what you're looking at. Um, so it's fairly helpful in terms of that, but we are seeing a lot of you know, the varietals are all in bold, which is very helpful. Cabernet Sauvignon, you can see here, we've got a lot of this happening right now. Cabernet Sauvignon, again, a lot of California in here, pretty much all California. This was a very, very California centric. Um, you've got here, uh, um, and then all the way down here, we've got a couple of Argentinas. So this is again, within each section, you may find in this particular case, we've got a whole lot of, um, California, and then at the end, they're finishing off with some foreigns. But down here, it's all mixed in, right? So we've got an Argentina under proprietary blends. We've got, you know, your, uh, your Argentina at the top in California, California, Washington. We've got another down here. We've got South Australia. Um, sometimes, and I find this to be the most helpful, they will be listed uh, in terms of kind of like body or weight or mouthfeel in from lightest to sort of heaviest. This is not always the case though. I find that in a lot of of, um, a lot of restaurants will do this, especially if they're sort of more familiar with the, the usability of a, of a wine list. Um, but, you know, you can kind of tell at first glance, looking at it, no, not always, but especially on smaller lists, you'll see sometimes like the Gamays and the Pinots towards the top of the red, and you'll move on down to your Cabs and your Malbecs at the bottom of that kind of list. If you see that, if you see that range, it's a good idea to kind of reference for the rest of the menu as well. Um, so in this case, again, we're talking a lot here. They have the blends. They're listing out the grapes for you to make it easier for you to understand. Linda's asking, what would be a proper response if you order a certain vintage that they bring you a younger vintage? Do you, can you ask for a lower price? That's a really great question. I would, I would argue, um, you would definitely want to let them know. You say, actually, you know, on, on this, on your menu, it says it is this vintage. 
Um, it looks like you're giving me a younger vintage. It's not always going to be the case that that wine will be less expensive. There's often vintage changes and oftentimes the wine price itself does not change. Now this can make a difference. Uh, I mean, especially when we're talking about like a California wine, well, not even, you know, when we're talking about certain wines, uh, a lot of times vintage isn't as imperative, but if you happen to know for a fact that you're like, I don't like that vintage. If it's a Bordeaux and you don't happen to like the 2012 vintage of Bordeaux and they bring you a 2012 instead of a 2011, let's say, you know, you can say, you know, I'm sorry, if you don't have the 2011, I'd like to select something else would probably be that. Um, Nancy says often the price would have gone up. Yeah. Uh, so vintage to vintage, a lot of times they will, the wines themselves wholesale will tend to go up and be more expensive. Although uh, restaurants can kind of um, negotiate, it depends. It really depends on what's happening. Like, especially with imports right now and tariffs, as, as wines are coming in from Europe, they tend to get more expensive, right? So wines will need to be adjusted. Uh, yeah. And it's true. You might even be getting a better deal if you, if they're offering you a younger, uh, an, a younger vintage at an older vintage price. It just really all depends. So it, it, my, my argument to that, Linda, would probably be only, I would, I would point it out to the server and have them, you know, say, ask if it's, uh, if it's similar in style or how it's different from the other vintage. Uh, if they don't know the answer to that, you can either, you can make a decision. Um, most likely you're not going to be able to get a price discount on it. Um, and hopefully they would have noticed themselves and said, you know what, we actually have the 2018, not the 2017. Would you still like this? Um, I know this wine list shows no vintages. Exactly. So also interesting. Again, normally, like I said, it should have the vintage on there. This may simply be a demonstrational um, sort of like a, when you look online too, these things will change all the time. Sometimes they'll have like, let's say they've got, you know, this, this Stag's Leap, um, you know, cab, they only have maybe four bottles in there because it's $600 a bottle, right? So the, it'll be on the list, perhaps, but by the time you get there, they might have sold out because they had a really big party of, you know, hey, everyone wanted some $600 bottles of, uh, <laughs> of Cabernet Sauvignon from Stag's Leap. It can happen. So there is, tends to be fluctuation still, um, and it may happen like under your nose. They, they may sell their last bottle while you're in there and not realize it, come back and let you know and offer up a suggestion for an, uh, a different option. Um, this is sort of a very, very basic wine that is all focused. Again, we have no <laughs> vintages here. Uh, in this case, we're looking pretty simple. White, red, rosé, orange, sparkling. This is the full wine list right here, people. We've got uh, everything we need right in front of us. So it does have uh, what they are doing. They're telling you producer, they're telling you varietal, and they're telling you region. Um, so they're not even saying California. Well, in this case, we know it's an all California restaurant. So everything has to be from California. That's their focus. But they are giving you sort of your, but this doesn't give you anything else other than that, right? Um, we've got a, this may look familiar to some people. Um, what if the wine list has no prices? Is it proper to keep asking the price best to take, best action to take? There, no, the, the wine list that you get for your, uh, you should definitely have um, prices on there. $100, uh, sorry, um, like, if you're at a place that has no <laughs> prices on the wine list that they hand you at the table, then you're going to go ahead and say, I, I'm looking for a bottle within this price range or a glass. Can you, can you tell me what the prices are? You can absolutely ask that. There's no reason that you shouldn't know how much what you're going to buy costs. That's absolutely your right as a diner. Um, so the, the reality is that a lot of times online, these prices won't be listed because they're not trying to know that off. Yes, I'm sure some of you do know this menu, but don't tell it. This is all very, very hush hush. But so this is a Spanish centric uh, menu, of course, and we're looking at a sample menu subject to change. They're very, you know, cause it's their online menu. Again, no prices, but here, you know, they're being very specific about here. They're giving the style of wine cause these are all sparklings. Um, we have, again, they're giving you the country. They're giving you the region. They're giving you all of that. Um, and then they've got Blanco, light and crisp. So they kind of put that down there. Um, and then they move on to domestic, right? So they're putting, because they have all of this like Spanish centric wine list, then you're moving into, they're giving you an option for some domestics. So you can find this for people who feel more comfortable with ones. And then of course, Vino Tinto, medium to full, medium and full body. And so you've got a lot of different options in here. Again, I just want to kind of point out what may what they may choose to do. You've got your vintages in here. You've got your size 750, just in case you didn't know that you were about to order a, um, you know, a half bottle of wine at a at a two hundred dollar price. That would be very very shitty. Um, Roger, when ordering a glass, how do you know if the bottle was open ten minutes ago or five hours ago? How do average restaurants deal with open bottles? You know, that is a really good question because I think that. Um, 
on average, a restaurant um, should be going through a bottle of wine. Uh, if it's open, um, it should really only be open for a day or so. Uh, it depends on how well they go through it. You, if you get a glass of wine and you feel like it tastes off or it tastes oxidized, you can go ahead and ask when the bottle was opened. Um, and I mean, that really that's gonna come down to how does it taste to you? Um, because some, some wines, some red wines in particular, white wines can last quite a while in the fridge, like four to five days. Um, we've all had this experience at home, I'm sure, when we save wine and then like four days later, we're suddenly like, oh no, that wine, I can't drink it, it's old. And you're like, oh, this is actually great. I might as well taste it. And then you, you find that this particular wine has been made well and has a, a good life outside of that. So it's it's an opportunity um, at restaurants, uh, on average, they should, they should test the bottle before they pour you the glass. And uh, if, if, it's, if it's not good, let's say, then you would wanna go ahead and, uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, you would wanna let them know that. And then they should pour you a fresh glass or open a new bottle. But most wines which should last pretty good. Um, totally had a regular who would say whatever was open today. Alessa, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And there are some people who are very particular about it and, and let them know that's, that's good to know. Be like, hey, and if, and if you are a server, obviously you know this, you can say, you know, I, I don't know right now. Let me go check with the, with the, with the bar and see what's been open today. Um, so this one, I just wanted to show you, this is a French, a French focused, uh, and, and also, I mean, there's a lot of different ones on here, but this is from a French restaurant. We've got a lot of, as you can see here, um, what I wanted to point out with this is you have champagne. This one is very focused on region and then style. So it's helpful to know that we've got, um, you know, champagne, champagne, and then sparkling to let you know, hey, we're no longer in champagne. It's still a sparkling wine. There are a lot of, there are some restaurants who would have like a sparkling category or a champagne category and might put multiples that are not from champagne. It's possible. But down here, of course, we've got Chablis because Chablis is Chardonnay, but then we have Chardonnay listed, Pinot Grigio, Riesling, Sancerre, which we know is Sauvignon Blanc. So this one is really going with a, um, a structure that's, a, that's more towards someone who is familiar with these regions, who knows that these varietals are specific to regions and the regions have specific varietals. Uh, down here, Bordeaux, Cabernet Sauvignon, Chassagne Montrachet, uh, Pinot, actually, that's pretty cool, yeah. Um, they wanted to let you know that it's Pinot right here, which is interesting. Um, so just in case, Chateau Neuf de Pop, they're not putting the wines in there, but you know it's a Southern Rhone. It's going to be a Southern Rhone blend because that's what Chateau Neuf de Pop is. Um, they have Cross here. What I wanted to show about this was they have basically, they made a special sommelier section, which I thought was really nice, but you've got, um, oh, and then we've got sort of Blanc. There's just sort of unassuming wines from the Psalm. This is a great example of what your Psalm should be, do for you if it's not already written down. Bordeaux Blanc, it tells you what it is tells you where it's from. This is exactly what's in it. Here are the grape varietals, a tasting note, um, suggested food pairings. This is very, very helpful stuff. And if this isn't on the menu, you can absolutely, your sommelier should 100% be able to do this for you for uh, pretty much any bottle or especially any glass that's on there. And almost any bottle should definitely be, uh, they should have a good opportunity to tell you that. So I just want to kind of show that as well. Um, I think that's just a, a really lovely kind of opportunity to to see how uh, accommodating some, some wine lists can be. So that's that basically kind of what I wanted to go over today. It's kind of, it's pretty basic, but I think it's really important. Um, I do mean that when I say, I think you guys all have enough information to go in and, and take a wine list and feel confident about it. Just um, know that you have that, uh, you know more than you think you do. If you if you know what you like, if you can go in and just be able to answer those four questions, it's an opportunity to, to be able to start a conversation with the person who's putting this list together. And like I said, I do this all the time because again, there are, believe it or not, I mean, it's very easy to believe, there are wines that I don't know. <laughs> I have not drank everything in the world. I can't wait for when that day happens. But up until then, I'm, I'm going to ask people for their recommendations. And the better, the more opinionated they are, the better. I love it when I get a psalm at a restaurant. I'm like, you know what? I kind of like funky whites. What do you have that's in the sort of like funky white, kind of earthy, but fuller bodied? You know, and they'll be like, ooh, we just got this great sort of blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and it's, that's the fun stuff to me. And then I geek out with them. And we have a great time. So it's like really, really lovely. Deborah's asking what the proper uh, etiquette is for corkage. Um, you mean like if you get a cork bottle, right? Um, so if, if, if it's corked, you would want to go ahead and before you, uh, you would note that when, they, when you tasted the wine, when that wine was poured for you and then you, know, you, you did the smell. Uh, and a lot of times, um, you, know, you can usually tell 
you there's you know let's say seven times out of ten you have uh you smell that wine and then it becomes you know kind of pretty quickly whether or not it's corked or whether or not it's flawed in some way sometimes you need to taste it if you're not sure um you, you know it's like you want to um feel like <laughs> uh you have the uh, feel confident to say you know what i think this might be off this doesn't taste quite right to me um and then you say i think it's corked i'd like a different bottle they should offer you a new bottle um and sometimes they might take it back i mean if it's again if we're talking a 600 dollars bottle of wine they might like go check it out first and be like no this is how it's supposed to taste or how it's supposed to smell because that happens too right sometimes wines need to breathe and open up and maybe in that first pour you know it needs a little bit of time uh you can but don't be don't don't be shy about saying hi you know that i think this wine this wine doesn't this tastes off to me or it smells off is there any way we could open a fresh bottle um or something along those lines that works for uh for wines by the glass as well tips on tips on tipping a sommelier um i mean it's just like with tipping a waiter although most of the time the sommelier is going to be tipped out by the service team and um, when you have a psalm that's generally part of their position they get a portion of the tips from the servers so the structure of a restaurant which we can have another class on at some point is usually bartenders and um and psalms and oftentimes hosts will get tipped out from the general pool. So don't, don't skimp on the tip to your uh, <laughs> server if you like your psalm. But if you wanted, I mean, I guess if you wanted to slip the psalm at 20, you could, it's, it depends on the, on the place. I, I, I don't know too many people who say no to extra money, but um, you know, uh, tipping the psalm is, is usually taken care of with the general gratuity for the, for the evening um, as sort of portioned out and allotted. Okay. Well, that's it. Once again, I've kept you all well past. It's now into a full happy hour as opposed to a happy half hour. I don't know why you guys let me keep jabbering on like this, but I do. Um, so thank you all very much for joining me. Um, happy December, happy holidays. Uh, for those of you, I hope you can join um, the Italian sparking class. That's next week. <laughs> Sandra, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You guys are really great. Yeah, happy holidays. If I don't see you at the Italian next Thursday, our next, uh, these webinars that will be sort of gratis for everyone are moving to the first Wednesday of the month. So the first Wednesday in January, I'll see you all there. Topics will be out mid month of this month and we'll have classes up for 2021 sometime in the next couple of weeks. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, thank you. This was great. We enjoyed You're welcome, it. welcome, you guys. Thank you yeah. very, very much. I appreciate it and ta-ta. Cheers. Happy holidays. <laughs>